of the month talk. Um, a little bit of an odd format uh, for me to, to introduce uh, our guest speaker because I'm, I'm online, so apologies uh, for that. But it's with great pleasure that we're welcoming Angela Cassidy, who's um, an associate professor in science and technology study who's based at Streatham. But we are lucky uh, that she's on study leave this term and affiliated to Hath Cornwall and to um, the ESI. Um, Angela's uh, expertise spans across um, science and technology studies, uh, environmental agricultural history and the history of science, technology and medicine. Uh, she's interested in science policy relations, uh, science communication engagement and interdisciplinarity. And actually, she is currently involved in Renew and, and uh, co-leads uh, the collaboration and practice theme. Um, so, Angela, thank you so much for um, joining us today and over to you. OK, uh, thank you, Camille. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this. Um, so it's uh, prompted me to try and think about all the work that I've done across my career and how it might actually fit together. So either I've horribly bitten off more than I can chew, or I'll be able to convince you that it does fit together. We'll see. We'll see where we go. <laughs> um, so in particular, the prompt of thinking about challenges. So rather than thinking about kind of topics or disciplines or whatever, what are the kind of the, the really important challenges that, that you deal with in, in your research? And I realised that all of my work kind of thinks about the spaces in between in one way or another. Um, but how they um, develop in different ways. And so I've kind of themed this across three areas of work. So thinking about conflict, uh, thinking about coexistence, and then thinking about collaboration. Um, I'm going to be covering quite a lot of ground because of uh, the way that I've decided to put this talk together. So um, bear with me. Um, if there's anything you're not sure about, then do grab me afterwards. Um, I'd love to talk more. OK. OK, so just to give you an overview of what I'm going to try and gallop through in the next 40 minutes. Um, so firstly, um, so firstly, just a little bit of introduction about myself and also some core ideas that kind of underpin all the different kinds of work that I do. Uh, then initially, I'm going to be talking about conflict and particularly talking about uh, work on public knowledge controversies and what happens when scientific controversies kind of spill out into the public sphere and why that happens. Um, I'll move on from that to then start thinking about coexistence and relationality connections between humans and non-humans. And the link there is via my work on the controversy on about badges and bovine TB. Um, and once I've worked my way through that and thinking about uh, human non human relations and that coexistence isn't necessarily comfortable, and that's actually quite an important thing to be thinking about. Uh, finally, I'm going to talk about collaboration and some of my research on interdisciplinarity that is uh, still in progress. So take a deep breath and I'll start galloping. Um, and hopefully change the slide. <clears throat> Yeah. Ah, yeah. There we go. All right. So much for quicker. Anyway, uh, introductions. So just to briefly a little bit about myself. Um, so these days I've kind of given up trying to define what kind of discipline I am. Uh, and I often introduce myself as an undisciplined scholar. I started off in the sciences and like a lot of people in STS then moved across into the social sciences. Um, but the particular kind of STS that I do combines social science research with historical approaches and increasingly uh, working and thinking about arts practice as well. Um, and so talking about myself as undisciplined is kind of fun. It's interesting to see how people react, but it's also more and more people are beginning to write about this. And for me in particular, I just recently found this quote and I thought it was wonderful because it really expresses why I kind of do this really awkward thing is because I think it does get, enable me to think about things in different ways. Um, another, also a core idea, which is just gonna underpin all of the whole talk, is thinking about academic disciplines as 
what we in STS sometimes describe as epistemic cultures. So this is kind of a core idea that we often think about academic disciplines as these big, solid things with hard boundaries around them, so English or biology or whatever. But thinking about it, especially from the point of view in history and science, is that academic dis disciplines really aren't fixed and they don't have hard boundaries and they're constantly changing over time. Um, that disciplines themselves arise from the ongoing processes of interaction across and within scientific communities. Um, and as uh, researchers work together, they create shared assumptions, standards, methods and practices, and those eventually become disciplines. Um, but that's in a constant process of change. And so in particular, uh, thinking about a thing called boundary work can be really helpful because it, it's means you can identify places where disciplinary boundaries are changing or being negotiated. So boundary work is kind of the strategic rhetorical creation of boundaries either around the science, what is science in the first place, or between different disciplines. Um, <clears throat> so from this point of view of thinking about disciplines as process, um, therefore, you've always got people doing interdisciplinary research all the time. It's, it's just going to happen. Um, so that's kind of going to be constant. But what's going to change is whether that research is supported and how it might be expressed. And that's really contingent on social political context and institutional context. And so that's why we see um, ideas about interdisciplinarity come and go. So, so just hold that in your mind, this idea of, of disciplines as, as, as an ongoing process, the thing that's moving the whole time. <clears throat> OK, so theme one, uh, conflict. So um, this is kind of where I came, came into academic research. So my um, uh, PhD research was all about this. I was thinking about uh, what are called public knowledge controversies. So in general, as part of that whole process of interaction and knowledge building that I just talked about, is that controversies happen, they happen all the time. It's kind of inherent to how scientists build knowledge. But those controversies are usually taking place in very specialist fora. So in academic journals, in conferences, in coffee rooms, in seminars like this. Um, but every so often you get controversies that spill out into the public sphere. Um, and so this quote from Sarah Watmore is just a really good definition of what we mean when we're talking about a public knowledge controversy. Um, so where knowledge claims and technologies are all become under interrogation um, because they're um, also informing regulation and policy, that all, all of these things come under contest at the same time. Um, and one of the things in my PhD is that I started with this thing called evolutionary psychology, which is still around, um, but at the time had only just started to appear. I'd done an undergraduate degree in biology uh, and had studied things like social biology, never heard the term, suddenly it was all over the media. So my question was, where has this thing come from? Um, and so the underlying question in my whole PhD is kind of why do you get controversies spilling out into the public sphere? Now, sometimes um, this is a wider body of work that wasn't my PhD. It's a matter. It is a matter of politics that there are certain kinds of scientific issues are exposing deep fault lines in society. Um, and so they're going to drive public contestation, almost kind of whatever you do. Um, that doesn't mean that science in these areas can't be further politicised, but it's that there is these certain kinds of topics are just kind of going, this is going to happen at some point. Um, but, and to an extent that was happening with evolutionary psychology and that the claims being made are very political, particularly around gender politics. Um, but what you can also think about with evolutionary psychology is a number of factors. So firstly, thinking about media pull. So why, 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 was it, why did the media want to cover this thing in the first place? Um, scientists and institutions are constantly issuing press releases, but not all of them get coverage. 
Uh, but evolutionary psychology had this really strong media pull because it was a topic that has uh, what media scholars call news value. So it's something that it's just going to appeal to audiences or more importantly, journalists and editors assume it's going to appeal to audiences. It's literally a sexy subject. Uh, evolutionary psychology in the 90s was all about sex. It was all about gender essentialism. It was all about celebrity. And it was all about, all about controversy. And controversy itself is a thing that media like. So it was a topic that kind of was very contingent sorry, not contingent, congenial for, for the news, particularly at this point in time. Um, <clears throat> so that's one set of factors that was going on. Um, however, we can also think about kind of what's happening when scientists themselves are going into the public sphere. Um, and so, you know, why, why do scientists do this? Um, First answer is most of the time they don't. We've all got better things to be doing. Um, we're doing our own research. Um, particularly as you go further back into the 20th century, uh, doing media publicity was kind of frowned upon and it was seen as very counter to conventional scientific norms. Um, but what we have seen as a change over time, uh, particularly since the 90s, is this shift to it's a horrible, horrible word called medialization. Some uh, other scholars talk about mediatization, which is even worse. But what it basically means is that we've seen a shift to public performance and people, the media itself, interacting with other areas of society and other areas of society is thinking about their performance in media because it's mutually beneficial. Um, so that's a shift, a wider shift that has happened. And we can all feel that pressure to communicate our research, kind of get exposure, so on and so forth. Um, so that's kind of happening anyway. Um, <clears throat> and that was clearly something that evolutionary psychologists really capitalised on. Um, however, there was also something else going on with evolutionary psychology. So when, um, when the field was first developed, when psychologists first started picking up Darwinism, in this time round, psychologists have done it before, but that's another story. Um, so when they first started to pick up Darwinian ideas this time round, um, they found that other psychologists really didn't want to know. They weren't interested. They found it very difficult to get published. They um, didn't have very much kind of reputation. And so the evolutionary psychologists decided to kind of go around those disciplinary constraints by communicating uh, actively in, in public, so courting the media, using all that con um, congenial news values to kind of get their ideas out there, um, spread ideas across disciplines, particularly via popular science books, um, and eventually gain, gain legitimacy, whether that legitimacy has continued or not in 20 years since is a whole other PhD that I'm not going to do. Um, but certainly at the time, it enabled them to establish a new field, establish their own journals, um, get jobs, kind of get their, build a reputation. Um, so what they were doing there was traditional scientific communication, but it was also doing something a little bit different. And if you look beyond evolutionary psychology, what you can see, again, looking back through the particularly the history of 20th century science, is that there are these times when scientists but to choose to um, communicate in the public sphere, particularly again via popular science, public lectures, books, things like that. Um, and this enables them to do things that they can't necessarily do in journals. So it enables them to do big thinking, wider speculation, theory building. Again, quite often this happens when the scientists themselves are feeling blocked within academia. So, um, Lovelock's Gaia is a really classic example of that. And so thinking about the science communication processes when this kind of thing is happening, then in turn going back into the sciences and changing how people think, how people think. So it's not just communicating outwards to the public, it's, it's also back into the sciences itself. Um, <clears throat> So with evolutionary psychology, we had both of these things. We had media pull and the science push. 
And certainly in the short term, it was very successful. Um, so once I'd finished that work, uh, various postdocs, and I started to get interested in the argument around badger culling, um, which was starting to get more and more lively around this time. And so I started to work on the controversy around ba badger culling. So we moved from evolutionary psychology to badgers via this question of public controversy. So again, you have this huge public controversy. Where is it coming from? Why is it happening? Um, and kind of the very, very short answer with, with badgers and bovine TB is that we've got politics, we've got science push, we've got media pull, and we've got a very, very, very long backstory. I think I can change the slide. And I'm not going to talk through all of this uh, because I could be here for a very long time. Um, but just to highlight that we've seen over 50 years of debate um, over badgers and bovine TB. If you go back further, we've got separate public controversies about badgers and about TB even before they came together in the 70s. Um, and what we've seen is kind of multiple rounds of public controversy, of new research, of politicians causing, calling for more evidence, um, and more controversy and so on and so on. Um, one of the important things to note in terms of thinking about where we might go next with this is that um, this is a not just a controversy that has a history, as in there's a whole load of stuff that happened before, but it has a historicity. So what happened before is then shaping the next round of the debate. But what we often see, and certainly what we have seen in the past, is that uh, policy actors, scientists, politicians, whenever they start a new round of what we're going to do about this mess, don't really want to think about what happened before. And it has to be said, that's partly what we're beginning to see in the new policy here, which is all about dashboards and new tests and new technologies, and really doesn't want to think about the mess that has just happened. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Still not get the hang of the figure. Okay, so as I was researching the badges in TV, I started to get more and more interested in thinking about uh, how these interactions are happening across different groups of people, but also between people and what we sometimes describe as the more than human or non-human. Um, and thinking again about process, um, that when we're trying to understand uh, what's happening across the human and non-human is thinking about it in what we sometimes describe as relationality, um, that thinking about how our understandings of the actors, what and um, by actors I mean myself as a person, but I also mean a badger or a mycobacterium or a koiku, which I'll come on to in a bit, or so on and so forth. Um, all of these things are being co-constituted, and not just in terms of our ideas about them, but what the thing actually is, how the disease works, how the animal behaves. Um, and so something that really came through in, the, in the, my work on this is that alongside that tendency to not want to think about the past, is that repeatedly there was an underestimate of the agency of non-humans. The assumption was we make a new policy, we'll do some culling, the badgers will just quietly do what they're told um, and then everything will be fine. And of course the badgers didn't do what they were told, the farmers didn't do what they were told, the wider public didn't do what it was told um, and the mycobacteria certainly didn't do what it was told. Um, so when, when we talk about non-human agency it's real and material and it has very real material effects effects. And again, thinking about that from a historical point of view, that's why I've included this quote from Mandy Reese, because it's one of the best summaries I've found for how you can think about non-human agency in a concrete way. Um, again, it means once we start to recognise this, we can realise that non-humans have social roles. So just, just as we do as humans, you know, I'm an academic, I'm a parent, I live in the southwest, etc. 
Um, Non-humans have social roles as well. And partly those are social roles that people give them. Um, and partly they're a product of how non-humans, what they do in the world. Um, so this is most obvious when you think about animals, that animals have social roles, that pets, pests, food, wildlife, patients, lab subjects, all these are social roles. Um, you can also think about this in terms of microbes, you know, whether a microbe is considered to be a pathogen or not, uh, whether it's a commensal, whether it's an ally, uh, by chef, I'm talking about fermentation and cheese and things like that. Um, and you can extend this logic past, I tend to mostly think about animals and microbes, but you can extend it much further. And there are people out there thinking about how this might apply to plants, how it might apply to landscapes, and rivers, wider environments, uh, objects, and of course, technologies. There's a lot of people in STS who think about the agency of technologies. Um, so these more than human entities do shape society. And sometimes that's really obvious. And other times it's only visible through what scientists are doing and the scientific knowledge that's being built. And your classic example with that might be something like a microbe. Uh, knowing that a microbe is there and what it is doing is very dependent on scientists' knowledge and also scientists then taking that knowledge out into society. So that's really important. Okay. Um, second set of points around uh, coexistence. Um, and again, thinking about relationality and why it matters. So I'm not going to talk about lots, lots about living on animals because Sarah did it so elegantly a month ago. So if you want to know more about living on animals, go and watch Sarah's talk. Um, but I'm also really interested in living on animals, partly because of this obsession with things that don't fit. Um, and so uh, what you might describe as the living on animal is something that's in between or that resists or that ends up occupying multiple social roles. And cats is a really, really good example of that. You know, you can think about, think about them as a pet, as a pest, as charismatic wildlife, so on and so on and so on. Um, but from my point of view of thinking about science is that these liminal non-humans, because they don't fit in the boxes, it then means that they're often subject to boundary disputes. So another driver in the TB controversy was what's called an epistemic rivalry between basically vets and ecologists and also animal protection activists who have their own kind of expertise. Um, so it's another thing that for me makes liminal animals really interesting. Um, and related to that, uh, often when people write now about coexistence, make it sound like it will be a lovely fluffy thing. Human-animal coexistence is a thing that happens. It doesn't necessarily have to be nice or comfortable or indeed positive. Obviously, we'd like it to make it more, more positive, but sometimes you've got smallpox. Uh, what do you do if you have a non-human that is dangerous to humans? What do you do? You can't sidestep questions like that. Um, so we've been exploring some of these questions in a recent project of mine that looks at the role of food in human animal relations. So much more specifically animals here. So thinking about uh, things like bi the biological idea of commensalism, where you have co-evolved co roles of uh, different organisms living together, but only really one of them is benefiting. But also in anthropology, you have an idea called commensality, which is all about what people do when they actively decide to share a table, to share food, and how that fosters relationships. Um, so when we look at humans feeding other animals, uh, particularly what we see is that often people are doing this basically because it's nice, it's fun, makes people feel good. Um, a bit more deeply than that, and I think really important for thinking about ecology and environmental issues, uh, people feed animals because they want to care uh, for those animals. And they want to connect, and that sense of connection with non-humans is something that people value really deeply. Um, 
people feed other animals for pragmatic exchanges so we can get get our burgers and our milk and so on and so forth. Um, but what we also see is that very often humans feeding other animals have, has unintended uh, unintended consequences. Uh, sometimes, and um, obviously there's a lot of ecologists working on this, massive ecological consequences. It makes animals themselves behave differently. And if that animal is, is say, a polar bear, then you potentially have a lot of trouble there. Um, but those consequences are also social. Um, and again, the social consequences, so deciding whether to say cull or not, then has material consequences for non-humans, feeds back into the ecology. You see where I'm going with this kind of process idea. Um, and humans feeding other animals really quite often involves conflict. Sometimes it's in that unintended consequences phase, but in the a lot of the animals that I tend to look at, so things like badgers and where I'm going now with this work, um, the humans feeding other animals, sometimes it's intentional and then you get conflict because it changes the way the animal behaves or because different groups of people do or don't want to feed the animal or care for it. Um, but there's other situations where animals are eating human food, whether we like it or not. And sometimes that kind of animal gets called a pest. Um, so this is something I'm, I'm continuing to develop, is this question of what makes a pest? Um, so we see this in, uh, in the badger debate, um, but looking at it more broadly is that if you look at the literature on pests and what is a pest, for a start, the definition of what's a pest is really, really woolly. There are lots and lots of different kinds of definitions. Sometimes they involve food, sometimes they involve spreading diseases, sometimes they involve invasive species, but not, none of them is really particularly consistent. And that, to, to me, as a social scientist who studies things like boundary work, immediately flags that this definition is a political one. It's, it's constantly being negotiated. Um, but what you do see in the literature around pests is essentially there's two different sets of explorations that don't really talk to each other. So one of them is uh, basically a cultural exploration that comes from anthropologists and uh, um, people who study discourse and things like that. And they look at the language that people use around pests and say, you know, that there's this massive commonality, animals that are being constructed as pests tend to be written about in this kind of very dichotomous way. So you have the good badger and the bad badger. Um, they're often um, criminalized. So there's a whole load of criminal language that gets used around pests. Uh, there's a whole load of um, language that becomes very much more about uh, stigma and, and then starts to very much bleed over and feed back across into uh, racist discourses, and we need to be really aware of that. So there's this whole cultural argument, and often that rests on the fact that you can see that whether an animal is a pest or not is re really contingent to the point where some examples, for example, in Australia, dingo is one side of a fence, it's a charismatic wildlife that's really cared and belongs there, the other side of the fence, it's a wild dog, you, you just want to shoot it. So, so anthropologists make this argument that this is all cultural, it's all contingent, um, and there's nothing else going on. At the same time, if you look at what ecologists say, then they tend to write about human wildlife conflict, they'll talk about resource competition, they'll talk about things like disease spread, and talk about a whole load of material factors. And I'm not satisfied with the fact that those two things don't talk to each other. I haven't found a solution about how you get them to talk to each other, um, but I think it's incredibly important to do so. Um, so this is something I'm currently investigating in, historically in terms of looking at the case study of invasive koipu in the Norfolk Broads. That's a koipu. Uh, it's kind of like a beaver, but it's actually a rodent. It has weird big red teeth. Um, they come from South America, live in wetlands, um, but have been spread all over the world via the fur trade. 
Um, they are considered to be a very serious pest in large parts of Europe and in North America. Um, what makes them interesting to me is that they're one of, I think, three or four species that um, MAF, so the UK government, have ever actually managed to eradicate. Um, so they tried with things like squirrels, they tried with mink in the 60s, none of it worked. The only things that have really worked is a case of muskrats in the 40s, where as far as I can tell, they got there just quickly. Um, the koipu um, and some, oh, the word's gone, termites in uh, three houses in Devon. And it took 40 years to get rid of those. <laughs> so it's a really interesting case because of this. And it took similarly of the 30 to 40 years from the time when they started the eradication campaign to actually being able to say we have gotten rid of them. Um, so we know that it takes a lot of work to create a pest, but it takes even more work to get rid of it. And documenting quite how difficult that is is again very important, particularly when we look at a lot of rhetoric about invasive species, which implicitly tends to argue that that invasive species should be eradicated. But do they really seriously mean it? Do they understand quite how difficult that might be? Um, it also raises lots of really interesting questions of what do we mean by eradication? Do we really mean full extinction? And over what kind of space? When is that feasible? Um, and also lots of really interesting questions about long-term policy goals, which for any of us interested in environmental issues is really, really important. So the scientists and uh, pest officers who were involved in this managed to keep government and local support for this all the way through. So three or four or five different government administrations. They survived the Thatcher privatisation agenda. Um, there are two or three times where the Koiku is mostly gone. And so the people with the money kind of say, well, why are we bothering? And somehow or other, they've managed, they managed to cling on. And I don't know the answer to how they did that, but I really want to know. And I think it's a really important question to get an answer to. How am I doing? Yeah. OK. So, finally, collaboration. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, a project called Renewing Biodiversity Through a People and Nature Approach. It's the long thing. Um, but just very briefly to explain, so Renew is a project based at the University of Exeter, uh, partnered with co-investigators from the National Trust. Uh, there's a lot of it. <laughs> it's, uh, What's interesting for me, from the point of view of environmental history and the history of science, what's particularly interesting is the insight from ecologists and from natural science funders that in order to think properly about conservation, we need to put people at the centre, because a lot of traditional conservation practice has been about getting people out, creating nature reserves, creating separations. And Renew is all about the opposite. It's about, well, what happens if we put people at the centre? Um, so that's super interesting. Renew is also full of social science and humanities researchers, which I also find really interesting. Um, we have kind of four co core themes. I'm not going to troll through all of them, but essentially we have people looking at landscape, people looking at individuals, uh, people looking at communities. Um, and also at business. But then we also have cross-cutting work, um, which again, I don't have time to go into properly, but essentially we have um, work on um, computing and modelling support. We have work that's looking at how do you research things, do policy-oriented research in the sh short term. And then we have the thing that I work on, which I'll talk about a bit more in a minute, um, the other important thing is that we have a huge number of partners. We have co-investigators who in NGOs and National Trust and lots and lots of other non-academic partners. That's the idea. Uh, to get past the horrible diagrams, here's a picture of, of some of us in action. Um, and the thing I particularly like about this picture is that it shows how one of the things that I think makes really, really tick is that we do laugh. 
Um, we don't hang out in person as much as I'd like us to, um, but when we do, they're always interesting things happen. Um, <clears throat> so to explain a little bit more about the theme of Renew that I'm involved in. Um, so what we're, what we're actually doing is we're kind of doing meta research. So we are researching Renew to try and understand how environmental collaboration, how environmental interdisciplinarity works. Um, and we're doing that. So that's kind of the proposal language, but this is kind of it in plain English. What we're actually doing is that what we're doing is that we're doing a thing called embedded STS. So you're studying science that you're also part of. Um, and so we're studying the collaborative relationships in Renew as they unfold. So via things like ethnography, diary work, interviews, so on and so forth. So, so we're part of Renew and we're studying Renew. Renew is kind of our laboratory. Um, what we're also doing uh, is that we're working with oral historians to explore experiences of environmental collaboration going out past Renew, because otherwise we end up kind of being far too inward looking, um, and also into the past. And because we're at a time where environmental sciences themselves are about half a century old, it's a perfect time to be doing oral history about this. Um, and one of our explicit aims is to try and build um, better documentation of how this works and also building an archive of evidence for future interdisciplinary projects. And part of the reason why we think archiving is so important is that as we started to look at this, even before the proposal was written, is we learned that when you see a funding call about interdisciplinarity, it's often gauged as if this is the newest, latest, innovative piece of work. And what you find is if you read a little bit, there's not much literature, but some historians have been looking at this, that actually environmental scientists have been trying to do this for a really long time. They've been doing it basically for as long as there's been a thing called environmental science. Um, So within Renew, I'm also doing historical work to try and understand these past episodes. So one of these that's particularly striking is this thing called the Man and Biosphere Programme, which still exists as um, UNESCO reserves, but was originally supposed to be a research programme. And they published quite a bit of stuff about their early experiences. And it's incredibly striking that what's being said here, particularly this part, is something that if you go to the literature about interdisciplinarity, it's full of people, particularly social scientists, going, why, why are we, is somebody else setting the agenda? This, this keeps going wrong because we don't have a shared research programme. Why are there all these power differences across disciplines? So this is, for me, fascinating that you can have generations and generations of scientists doing this, writing about their experiences, and then nobody is even aware that those experiences have happened. So what's happening to that experiential learning? And that's what we're trying to investigate. How am I doing on time? Okay, Very good. Um, So we're doing that via documentary research. So Man and the Biosphere are also obviously the biggest example in the UK is we're also looking at the history of University of East Anglia and its relationship with the foundation of NERC. Um, because again, that is also an interdisciplinary story. Um, one of the things that we're finding across the oral history work and our embedded STS work is actually a lot more commonality than we were expecting. And we're beginning to draw out what you might call maybe a typology of different kinds. And that increasingly we think it's probably more helpful to be thinking about interdisciplinarities multiple rather than in an ideal version of interdisciplinarity that doesn't really exist. But um, across the people we're talking with, there are some people who very much see themselves as disciplinary. It's really important that they work from a discipline 
but they like working with other disciplines and see what happens when they bash against each other, that you get interesting sparks flying. You have people who think about themselves as diplomats. So they're maybe disciplinary or interdisciplinary, but what they do is work across two different areas. Um, we have people who um, sometimes, like myself, talk about themselves as undisciplined scholars or magpies. Um, if you want to see the most fantastic piece of interdisciplinary collaboration, if you Google um, magpie bird spikes, you will find this project, which is just awesome because it's also a collaboration with a museum and an artists uh, looking at uh, what some of these birds do with anti-bird architecture. It's wonderful, wonderful. And I love that the guy's hair matches the nest. Um, you also have people who talk about what's interesting is the space between and the, the weeds that come out of the space between. Um, <clears throat> the thing that nobody really talks about, but we should, is of course we're all following the money. Um, many of us are doing this because we will get funded to do it. I wouldn't have a career if it wasn't for these kind of funding agendas. Um, and we need to talk about that. Um, but what it does is it often leads many of us working in these kinds of areas feeling like the cats in the hand. We're just kind of constantly juggling this, that and the other. And also that interdisciplinary research is often very precarious, even more so than the rest of academia, because it's in the in-betweens. <laughs> OK, um, just to talk a little bit more about some of our emerging findings. Um, so I've already mentioned that there's this commonality. So you have these types, but we, what we're also doing is paying attention to the practical side of this. So rather than just kind of the noodling, the question of, well, what actually does work? What does help? Uh, particularly, we talk a lot about scientific practice and research practice. So what is it that you're actually doing on an everyday basis? Um, and what we're finding and some of this is confirmed by what's there in the literature. Some of the other stuff is a little bit new. Um, but front and centre is that interdisciplinarity really gets fostered by the ability to create spaces to hang out. Um, so hanging out together um, in, in physical place, but not always physical place, but creating spaces where people can interact get to know each other, build trust, throw around those crazy ideas. So, you know, when I was talking about popular science, that often within our conventional publishing, it's quite difficult sometimes to talk about something that's a bit off beam. So creating those spaces to do that kind of experimentation, tinkering, it's probably a better way of thinking about it. Giving researchers agency. Uh, and also giving researchers time. Something that really comes out is that any work like this takes at least twice as long as, an, as a disciplinary um, piece of research. Everything just takes ages because you've got to build it from the ground up. You've got to start from scratch almost. Um, and one of the things I worry about, again, thinking about it as a historian of the science, is that all of those things are attenuating in 21st century academia um, because they're not valued. Um, as I say, interdisciplinary research is more precarious, but that means that in turn, people who do this kind of work often talk about when things go wrong, it's because of things that are wider issues in research culture. So things like bullying, um, power hierarchies, stealing ideas, people not lose pulling their weight, all of those, the, the dark side of academia anyway, but being interdisciplinary means that it's those things are more likely to be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Um, <clears throat> on the positive side, we think a lot about how interdisciplinary practices often involve a bit of disruption, not in an Elon Musk way, but more in a kind of, I'm going to poke at this and see what happens way. So things like actively crossing boundaries, flattening hierarchies, talking and doing care, um, tinkering and playing. And we also talk about scaffolding, how institutions can best 
foster into this narrative, not by forcing from the top, but by creating those conditions to help academics do it for themselves. We do see that the interdisciplinary risks are continuing to be reinvented. We think uh, practices of fostering memory is therefore key, uh, but we also would really like to understand why. Again, we don't have good answers. Some of this is clearly about institutional amnesia because a lot of this stuff is really awkward and doesn't suit all sorts of uh, organisational and political agendas. Um, but we also wonder if partly with interdisciplinarity, because it's always going to be in, in between, that you can that you will have a temporary space for experimentation, but it can't be permanent. It's always going to collapse. And maybe that's why we keep going around in circles. Not sure. Okay, I'm going to finish off with something that also we don't have a good answer to, but I think is a really important thing for thinking about, particularly in Renew is that if we want to renew biodiversity, not only do we need to put people at the centre, but those that relationality, the relationships. And that means thinking about more than human actors as actors and as partners. I have no idea how you actually do that. There are other people who are writing much more about that than me, but I do think it's a really, really, really important question that we need to not forget. OK, at that point, I'm going to finish. Just briefly, um, some of the various research teams and funders and non-humans that I've worked with that have helped me think about all the stuff I've just been waving at you for the last 40 minutes. Uh, so thank you to all of them, because I wouldn't be doing any of it without all of those relationships and all of those people. Um, and at that point, I'm going to stop. I didn't get time to explain why the elephant is our emblem in Renew, but if anybody wants to know, I'm quite happy to tell you. Um, thank you. So in Camille's absence, I'm going to field questions. So is there any, I'm really just going to bring up folk online. So if you've got any questions online, if you just put your hand up and we'll come to you. Um, otherwise, anyone in the room? Andy? That's great. Thank you very much. I, I, um, I guess it's really interesting to hear from you as a professional that we keep reinventing the wheel with respect to interdisciplinarity, because often people are coming out of their discipline, attempting this new thing, and I guess rather than having an interdisciplinary you know, experts inform our approach. Um, are there, I don't know whether there are short documents or best practice things that could be shared? widely whereby we could inherit, we could stand on the shoulder of, of, of those giants that have succeeded in interdisciplinary or, or failed to understand why. Yes, yeah. um, so Rebecca's giggling because uh, uh, one of the things that we're doing in our theme of Renew is exactly that. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, with the coda that there are a hell of a lot of those guides out there. Right. Um, and one of the things we've tried to do when we reviewed is obviously review the academic literature reflect on our own experiences, but also try and bring together what you might call it. As they're basically, there's a grey literature on this. So there, there are loads and loads of these guides out there. Um, but yes, what we're, we're doing is so we produced a practice guide. Uh, version one we wrote last year, and we sent it out to get feedback from colleagues in Renew and also partners in Renew because it's super important. One of the things we immediately got back is, of course, the classic thing that you as an academic think you boiled something down and made it as simple as possible, and it was still far too wordy. So we're in process of creating a second version that is hopefully a bit more widely applicable. We're really happy to share that version with you uh, for now. Um, but yes, I think it's super important. As to why there's this enormous pile of reports saying these things and often saying very similar things, that I don't have a good answer to. I suspect part of it is because a lot of it is based on it, personal experience. And so it gets considered anecdote or anecdata rather than um, being part of any kind of rigorous evidence. Um, and that is in and of itself a problem because actually it's that experiential knowledge and it's the tacit knowledge and the feelings and the 
when do we have coffee and things like that, that, that we need to report. And that's what we're trying to do is sort of build that evidence base. Me? Thank you very much, Angela, for a great talk. Um, I'm going to follow up on Andy's question actually around how do you do interdisciplinary research? And of course, I feel like this is a topic we battle up with, I mean, actually every day at the ESI. And I was interested in what you were saying around hanging out. And I can mm -hmm. see how you would create spaces, uh, real spaces where people would hang out in person. But how do you create those spaces in in another virtual world? What, what, how, how do you, how do you give rise to interdisciplinary interactions and, and relationships in a virtual world? Now that's very much a work in progress, that one. I mean, it's, it's something that we've been in, in my other project and in, in this project actively struggling with. My other project started in the spring of the first lockdown. So it was complete mayhem. Um, <clears throat> we don't have good answers yet. I, I kind of feel like during the period of lockdown in those first two years, we started to come up with some really good solutions. And at the moment, it feels like a lot of people just have dropped it. Um, the, the, so doing an interaction over Zoom can be done in a really in-depth, interesting way. But it requires, again, it requires time and it requires people to make themselves a bit vulnerable. So things like cameras on and, and being willing to speak, uh, which is very hard because interacting in Zoom, as we all know, is absolutely exhausting. We've now got the additional issue of how do we combine? How do we try and do what we're doing now? And at the moment, we're still at a point where we're still really stumbling around, around that. Um, but... I think it's super important. Um, and I think the digital infrastructure that we have now that makes it possible is massively valuable. Again, the way that Renew works, uh, a lot of the routine interaction is online. Um, and sometimes that's an issue because I think it would be great if we could physically be together more. But there's a hell of a lot of people. And many of us work from home and we live all over the country. Um, I've worked. Uh, early in my postdoctoral career, I worked on projects like this pre all this infrastructure. And believe me, that was much, much harder. You would spend most of your, I have a strong memory of one project spending an awful lot of time on the train between Norwich and Manchester, uh, which is a very long train journey. Um, so I'm kind of, I have hope, but it takes active attention. Um, and I think this is one of the things about the digital infrastructure is that we assume the technology will do it for us and it won't. We have to put the work in. Um, so, yeah, slightly hand wavy answer, but I think it can be done, but we need to try. Yeah, and I think just thinking about some mm. of the, the online platforms that we have for doing that, you know, if, it, if you ask me to organise something with like breakout rooms and things, I'd immediately flinch and you know it feels like that should be within everyone's grasp yeah and really i think the technologies could be better i also have a real frustration that they they were developed for that time and they haven't got any better yeah um but some of us did do sessions that involve breakout groups and we can share that knowledge yeah. yes um yeah. there's also again kind of the real tacit stuff so for example in uh, a hybrid meeting, making sure you've got someone who's paying attention to the the online part and is being part of the online space, mm. and someone who's being the phys doing the physical space, and that that they are talking to each other. That we learned really early, mm. early on is absolutely key, and it's still surprisingly few meetings you see that done. So yeah, there's practical stuff too. I think Faye was first on yeah. mine, and then we'll come to you. That's all right, Faye. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. I really, really enjoyed your talk. I find it really, really. Um, I was just wondering how you and the people in the room and online um, feel about the term non-human. And um, I kind of 
struggle with it or more than human or whatever you want in terms of centralizing the human again and I, I kind of I don't feel like I've come across really any natural scientists um, perhaps because it's like a more material focus um, whereas I guess people from social sciences or social research is going to concentrate on phenomena like power and things like that um but yeah it, you know is it the is is that are the conversations happening that compare the terms for example non-white and is that a problem in terms of creating these new discourses and things already setting up like a bit of a power hierarchy especially if they're wanting to be partners with third crop bees that kind of thing um maybe <laughs> um yeah it's easier said than done um while assuming this is all language problem isn't helpful it is noticeable that for example with more than human social scientists love to talk at length and write at length about it um but of course it's the field biologists who are actually doing it and it's where those ideas actually come from, is from observing field biologists um, as they do their research, which has a really, really practical recognition that, you know, the bird is not going to sit still. Um, <clears throat> so I think the resonances are there, but I'm not sure anyone helps that much. Um, I'm not sure whether that really gets at your question, though. It's kind of more for discussion. like. <laughs> Um, it just doesn't sit quite, it doesn't sit well with me. And I was just interested in the different mm. disciplinary or people's perspective, um, whether it doesn't sit well with them or whether it's not a problem or. Yeah, I mean, for what it's worth, I actually, I find more than human quite clunky and awkward. And this is possibly the ex-biologist inside of me. Um, and, and often I prefer to talk about animals or plants or rivers or environments because actually your interaction with any of those things is going to be really different and if you clunk it into this thing called non-human or more than human then you you flatten all of that whereas actually the key is you know what does this badger do and how it's different to what that badger does um <clears throat> so that's that's hard um, on the other hand, sometimes you, you, you just need a term, just like any other jargon, and it's a lot easier to say more than human rather than animals and microbes and plants and rivers. And, you know, you could just be there forever. So, yeah, it's... Uh, don't know. Um, but I would also say that I think many of my not, um, social science colleagues are not necessarily... You can have fun playing with language and then forget that you need to think about talking across different fields. And that's something that's really key to interdisciplinary work is that what you're talking about makes sense within your own little sphere, but also makes sense elsewhere. Or if it doesn't make sense, understanding how it doesn't make sense. And you're only going to learn that by doing it and getting out there and interacting with people. Thank you. Quick one before we yeah, so I can I can kind of my my question wasn't about that but it actually related really, I I have um, I'm trying to write I, I'm trying to write from a kind of perspective at the moment so I can yeah, empathise with that and other ways um so for example like Donna Haraway talks about multi species rather than non humans it's like decentering kind of human always putting the human at the centre of these relationships whereas we are species why I'm kind of using that as a way to talk yeah. about it yeah. but yes yeah, one I, I find some of the problematic <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to find I'm struggling with that yeah. myself um writing about um, and indigenous ways of knowing this plant are very different from these kind of western top-down scientific ways um but the question I was going to ask was about starting interdisciplinarity from undergraduate level and would that kind of fostering those conversations from that young that kind of young development age when you're fostering who you are as a as a scientist or a, or a social scientist um yeah with that do you think that, that would kind of help because for example in synthetic biology lots of the PhD or master students they instantly get taught to do response motivation boot camp and they get to interact with social scientists from a very like early career stage but in other disciplines they don't have that so I think 
could there be something that would kind of bring the next generation of interdisciplinarians? <laughs> or yeah. better, you know, enable better communication between yeah. these things. Yeah, and again, that's partly about enabling and hanging out. Um, it's about maybe encouraging undergraduates to take at least one module that's outside their main lane and, and making it easier as an institution for that to happen. Um, there is a very long-standing repeated drum that gets banged by historians of science uh, that they or SDS people should be the people going in and teaching science undergraduates in order to do exactly this. What I find fascinating is that that's another one where people keep reinventing the wheel. Um, again, I'm not quite sure why, um, but I do think there's value in that, definitely. Um, and it's something I'd like to see more of. I have worked in institutions where the, when I first learned to teach, it was doing that kind of teaching. Um, and it taught that to, taught me a lot as a developing researcher. So, so yes, I think it's massively valuable and I'd really like to see a lot more of it. But again, when it happens, it's very variable across different institutions and variable across time. There have been times in the past where that's been much more of a standard thing in degrees and it seems to have gone away again. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to see more of it. OK, I think we've run out of time, but thank you again, Angela, for joining us. And thank you thank for joining you. us on the Thanks very much.